It is. It can be a lonely journey. And I think that's when I realized that speaking up is how I wanted to take that journey forward. It was my learning, probably my calling, um, where I felt like even if by speaking up, if I was able to impact just one life, the purpose would be served. Um, where in 2022, I never imagined that today, you know, if you asked me in 2014, would I be sitting here having this conversation with you about the incredible work the foundation has done? No. At that point, it was really about just doing one interview on a, on a national television or one interview just to be able to reach out to as many people as possible and share my experience. Um, and then when I did that, it didn't feel to me like the journey ended there. It felt like just the beginning. It felt like there was so much more to say and so much more to do. And that culminated into the foundation and, the, and, and all of the work that we do today. Wow. If we just go back and you do so much excellent work with this, I think like you're saying, if it can impact even one life, of course, when you spoke about it publicly, before that, you had to speak about it privately because we all acknowledge it and you reach out to somebody, you know, a friend, whoever, to talk about it. Uh, and I think that's the first step that people find very difficult to make. So if you can just talk to people about that, did you face any resistance? Did you face acceptance? What happens in that first step? So I give all the credit to my mother for recognizing the signs and symptoms. Um, because it just happened out of the blue. I was on a career high, everything was going well. So there was no reason uh, or no apparent reason why I should have felt the way I was feeling. But I would break down, um, you know, for no reason. I would feel, the day, there were days when I just didn't want to wake up. I would just sleep because sleep for me was an escape. Um, I was suicidal at times and so, Having to deal with all of that, and you know, when my parents live in Bangalore, and every time they sort of visited me, even now when they visit me, I always put on a brave front, like everything is okay, and you know, you always want to show your parents that you're fine, you know. Um, and so I was doing one of those things of like, I'm fine, until you know, they were leaving one day, they were going back to Bangalore, and uh, my I, I broke down, and my mother asked me the usual hygiene questions, like. Is it a boyfriend? Is it someone at work? Has something happened? And I just didn't have answers. It was none of these things. Uh, and it just came from a really empty, hollow place. Um, and she knew instantly. And I think that, for me, was God sent. Um, and I really hope, and I think that's one of the reasons why I set up the foundation, for us to be able to create that awareness to be sensitive to the people around us, to look around us. If someone's feeling low, don't just pat them on the back and say, hey, you know what, it's going to be okay, or, you know, hey, you'll be fine, or just listen to this music or play some upbeat music and think that everything's going to be okay. If you feel, and this is for everyone in this room, if you feel for a prolonged period of time, which is more than three weeks, if you feel a feeling of low or sadness, um, it is recommended that you see a psychiatrist or at least see a counselor. And my theory is always I'd rather be overcautious than not. Um, you know, it's the same way when you have, you know, when you have a stomach bug or, you know, you go and see a general practitioner. You can also go and see a general practitioner. That's one of the things that we do. We're capacity building for our country because we do not have enough mental health professionals to serve the 1.3, 1.4 billion people. So one of the things that we do is, is capacity building by educating general practitioners. So I'd say don't ignore the signs and symptoms. Don't ignore when someone's telling you they're feeling low or not feeling okay. Um, don't sort of brush it off by saying it's just a one-off. Um, so coming back to this, yes, it, it's my mother who recognized that I needed help. I spoke to a counselor who I knew. Um, again, I was fortunate to have known someone within our family circle. Um, and from my voice, she could tell that I, was, that I needed uh, professional help. 
And then the journey went on. I, you know, I was put on to a psychiatrist, medication, that sort of went back and forth for many months. I was resistant to that because there was so much stigma attached, A, to mental illness, B, to, you know, you always have these sort of ideas that you don't want to take medication to do with the mind and with the brain and you're going to lose control. And so that went on for a couple of months. Um, until I finally started taking medication and I started feeling better and, 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 and so on. So it, it, and yes, it was my, the immediate people around me knew, um, but at that point I wasn't ready to tell very many people. It's after I recovered, after many, many months, uh, when, I, when I was sitting back and just thinking about this experience that I'd been through, um, that I felt like I wanted to share my journey with the world. And through this entire period, I think we can give a round of applause for that, please, everyone. And through this entire period, you're, you're getting up every morning and you're still having to put on the war paint and the smiles for the world because you've got to act in movies, you've got to sell movies, you've got to sell products, you're, you're on this high. Jeez, on a scale of 1 to 10, what was that difficulty level? Oh, very difficult. 11? Very difficult. Yeah, I mean, I can't even put a number to it. To just yeah. have to wake up every morning and to breathe, you know, to eat, to, to just do the basics was a struggle. So, so you can imagine what having to put myself out there, be at events, um, engage with people, perform, um, obviously took, took a lot. So I'm thinking the, the vision and the mission of the foundation, as you have said, from the time you started it to now, uh, you know, it's obviously grown so much. So, so what is the, the vision and the mission now of the foundation at this moment? It is to give hope, you know, because like I said earlier, it can be a, it, it can be a lonely journey. And we're here to say you are not alone. We're here to say we're in this together. When I say we, I mean us, those who experience mental illness, our caregivers, because I believe, we believe that they're an e equally important part of this journey, and society and community at large. Um, and so giving hope to every person experiencing stress, anxiety, and depression, um, and to let you know that we're not alone. And it, it stemmed from the one line, which was, you know, when I put my mind to it, I said, I don't want even one life to be lost because of mental illness. Oh, beautiful. What well, you did this, that you started this, and it's truly helping people. Every day. Um, there's not a day that goes by um, when, a, a, when a person doesn't come up to me and, and talk about an interview that I did mm. or um, you know, something that they read or something that they saw that, um, that prompted them to seek help or encouraged them to, to tell someone they know to seek help, that they felt better, that they're on the journey to recovery. Um, and each one of us in the foundation experienced that on a daily basis. There's somebody or the other who's, who'll, who'll always acknowledge the work that we've done. And that, for us, is the most fulfilling part. You know, we can have numbers on a slide and, and talk about how many lives we want to impact in the next five or 10 years. Those are all long-term goals. But it is those everyday moments when you meet someone, when they say, we saw an interview, or you know, we saw this social, uh, post on social media, or um, you know, there was this one kid who came and said, I couldn't explain to my parents, I wanted to seek help, but I couldn't explain to my parents what I was going through. And I made, I made them sit down and watch your interview. And after they watched your interview, they understood what I was going through. And they, they allowed me to go and see a psychiatrist. Those are the moments we live for. That's absolutely beautiful. That really is. It's... Okay, we need to, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you a few questions that I know the crowd really wants to ask you. And this is a question that I know she's been asked a hundred times. And that's why I'm going to change the question. My most favorite movie? No, no, no. Okay. It's the same, same, same vein oh, it is. Okay. It's like, they're like, if you were not an actor, what would you be? So I've changed it to, if you were not a badminton player, what would you be? Because that means you can't say badminton player. 
But badminton would not have been my answer. Oh, we have something new coming. Yeah. So let let's just guys just rewind, just delete. Let's do a little Christopher Nolan here. Just delete that. Uh, so the other question is: If you were not an actor, what would you be? I would have probably been uh, an interior designer. Yeah, that's something I've always been very, very passionate about. Somebody who's just bought a new apartment who's very excited. It's like, they get blue cut in I'm happy to render free services. That's how passionate I am about interior design. Um, I've always been, even as a kid. Um, and I, at one point, I did have this plan to go to like some like design school abroad wow. and yeah. yeah. Uh, can I just collectively say we are very happy you didn't make that decision. <laughs> and we are very happy that but you... I, but I channelize my energies now differently. Like I, I do up the home and I keep changing things around and I have fun with it. Please do all those things but don't stop doing films ever, right? So that's all. We, we are all very selfish people. We only care about that. Uh, okay, I was not going to ask you your favorite film. But now I feel like we should ask her, no? Favorite character? Can you ask favorite character? Because film becomes like, oh no, you said something about the director and about the other. So favorite it boils character. It's down to the same thing. It's like, oh, she chose this character over okay, that so, character. Okay, so I'll make it a very harmless, innocuous question. The favorite character you enjoyed playing? Um, I'd have to say it's very difficult though. I mean, it's like saying choose this child over that child. <laughs> but. If I really had to choose, and you guys are putting me in the spot, but I'd say Piku. Yeah. It was very special. There was something very, very special about the energy on that movie. Um, and I feel like my sister and I are at that age now where we feel like we're Piku. Yeah. So, just, I don't know, something about Piku is very, very special. And that's one of the movies that sort of keep coming up in conversation when I talk to people. They're like, we really like that movie or like someone's been through that experience or going through that experience or, you know, lost a parent. And so there's, there's a lot of that, I feel like. Maybe it's just the, the stage of life that I'm at now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that seems to be my most uh, favorite. But just on that film, one second, how daunting was it? Because these are two experienced, like, powerhouses, right? And first, I must say, you held your own against them. You were absolutely fantastic in that film. Whoever agrees, please give a round of applause because you were fantastic. Like, koi shak. Koi nahi. Koi bhi nahi. How was it though? Did it, did it get easier through the days or? No, I mean, like you said, I, I was just aware of the fact that I was going to be opposite these two incredible people. But I think what makes for great collaboration is when you're not competing with the you know, yeah. with, with your co-stars. You're really genuinely invested in, in telling a good story. And um, I think that's, that's what we were there to do. I don't think Irfan was trying to be one up on Mr. Bachchan or he was trying to be one up on anyone. You know, it, it's yeah. just, it was a beautiful collaborative process. And I think we were all just invested in giving our best to the film. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I was aware, I was aware before I got into this that yeah. I was going to be with two of these most incredible actors. But that's that. I mean, when the camera's rolling, I'm not thinking of Mr. Bachchan. I'm thinking of the character that I'm opposite. Yeah. I have to say that there were three master musicians at play, and it was a beautiful symphony that came out. So that was fantastic. Let's talk about jewelry because that's core competence for a lot of people in this room. So do you remember... Okay, it's, it's a two-part question. First is when you were a child, do you remember the, the piece of jewelry that you really wanted and you said, oh, when I make money, or when I grow up, I'm gonna, this is the first piece of jewelry I'll get? For me, it's always been more sentimental and emotional than sort of looking at a hoarding or, you know, putting my finger on something and saying, this is what I want. So there were definitely pieces of jewelry, and my sister and I were discussing it this morning, there were definitely pieces of jewelry in our mother's uh, locker that I had my eyes on. And I still have my eyes on. Does them. your sister know about this? Does your, does your sister, eh? does Yeah, she? I, I yeah. mean, the good thing is, I think our taste in that sense is slightly different. Um, so, so that's the good thing. So I know that like eventually when the jewelry gets split between the two of us, I don't think we'll be scrambling and fighting, but uh, yeah, there were definitely like pieces that I, you know, you, as a young girl, you see your mother getting ready, uh, going out, 
and you know she takes out her jewelry she's deciding what to wear and as a young girl you're like oh that's beautiful you know i i hope i can i hope i get that uh, or i hope i get to wear that forget i mean owning it but i i hope i get to wear that someday so definitely pieces like that and i think being a south indian definitely a lot of traditional south indian craft in the jewelry which is temple jewelry which i absolutely love that's very very different from say you know jewelry from any other part of the world um and that's something i really enjoy wearing as well and do you remember the first piece of jewelry you bought when you you started earning money yes i bought myself a pair of solitaires small nice. <laughs> ah look at that that's the diamond table <laughs> <laughs> very small large for me at that point um uh, but yes i remember buying myself a pair of solitaires fantastic okay before we wind up i think people here want to know one thing about you that nobody knows give us something give us like one thing something like you drink rasam straight from the katori or something just like we we need something i drink rasam like this oh no um see that i love south indian food and rasam rice i'm sure everybody knows that uh i revealed the fact that if i was not an actor or a badminton player i'd be i'd love to be an interior designer hmm that i'm ocd does anyone know that okay somebody said yeah i am yes we know somebody said i am uh, oh you know that <laughs> are you as well are you no you know are you sure put a bag on the table let's see take it away from oh she did well done that i'm very punctual does anyone know that i'm punctual okay oh, they don't time know management cause... time management i'm time great. Management. okay i'm i'm great with multitasking i'm very good with time management and my gut instinct is something i protect these all nice cool things she's saying okay yeah. fine i'm a great were, okay wait we were hoping for like a, wait, something wait, wait, which wait, makes wait, you wait. more human like us do i win a hamper or no for this answer of there's no <laughs> okay this bottle okay you bottle of water yeah <laughs> um i'm a great baker i bake really well okay we up now how do i argue with perfection right unfortunately we can't find any imperfection in this perfection tell me uh, uh, like are you clumsy like do you drop food when you eat Oh yeah all the time i was known for this yeah like when i was small and now she's going to start laughing <laughs> we never remembered restaurants based on i never rem oh my family never remembered restaurants based on the name of the restaurant it was the restaurant where dipika dropped milkshake <laughs> the restaurant where dipika dropped a fork the restaurant where she spilled sweet corn soup on herself so that's how we remembered uh, restaurant names Nice, and I think that's how those restaurants are now advertising in Bangalore as well. This is where they pick a spilled soup, so please come and have some, ladies and gentlemen. They pick up our corner. Big round of applause, please. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Can we please have a big round of applause? Come on, you can be a little more generous in the applause, everybody. Didn't even make it till here. All right. I like to request Mr. Colin Shah, uh, Chairman GJEPC, to please come up on stage to join him. Mr. Sachin Jain, MD, De Beers, India. Mr. Soma Sundaram Pia, Regional CEO of India World Gold Council. Mr. Sri Ram Natarajan.